so we're going to look at elasticities today. Um, chapter 6 begins on simple pricing. And looks at the demand curve. And we need to be kind of comfortable with demand and marginal revenue. Again, some things that the uh, that that kind of just gloss over pretty quickly as you read through um, the material. So let's uh, do a little example. Oh, they got that. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Must be some church camp, maybe, I'm guessing. Looks like there was a Baptist van or something out there. It's a church camp. All right. So let's take a simple demand curve. So the law of demand tells us that as you drop price, you're going to sell more. So if we take a demand curve here and start off at uh, $10, and maybe we'll just make this fairly easy here and go 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three. I guess I should have scaled it going up. It's all right. Hold something like that. Okay. Um, and let's say, well, let's make this a little more fun here. Let's say that at at ten dollars, you're selling uh, 120 units, and at nine dollars, uh, 140 units, and we'll. have to really do the whole thing here we'll just come down to maybe we'll go up to 220 down to five so what good are we selling here ranging from the price to one dollar to ten dollars give me a good any good any good any good socks, socks. first thing is socks so we're at in the sock industry, and we've got socks. Um, are these dress socks or sports socks? Sports socks. Sports socks. All right. So sports socks. These must be the higher end, running nice. Take They're all the Nike take all the sweat out of your feet type of socks. Okay. So that's our demand curve. Now, a couple things with demand that sometimes we take for granted. Uh, one is that if the price was $9.50, given that the, we've got this other data here, would you expect to sell 220 at 950 and then if you drop to 9 it comes back to 140 No, right? that doesn't make any sense. That, so we'd expect preferences to be such that it would be fairly filling in the blank, so to speak, a continuous line of dots. Soon those dots would get so close together that they would form a line. And so we usually just put a line down. But I don't want you to forget the two-dimensional relationship that it's really capturing between the price of a product and the quantity that people will buy. So that's what the law of demand is. As the price of a good falls, the quantity purchased will increase. And that turns out to be a complete lie if you don't hold the rest of the world constant. So we have this little saying in economics, ceteris paribus, holding all other things constant. Things like what? Well, things like your income, because if, if there's a drop in price, uh, but then you lose your job and you have no money at all and no income and no future ahead of you because you didn't finish your education, uh, you might not be buying those socks even if the price falls, right? So we can't change income, taste or preferences, price related goods, all kinds of stuff like that. So here's the law. 
law of demand. I'm just going to give you guys kind of the shorthand notation. Uh, increased price leads to a decrease in quantity demanded. Ceteris paribus, holding all of the things constant. Holds a fall. I did the example, a fall in price would lead to an increase in quantity demanded. So what are we holding constant? Whatever we're holding constant turned out to be our shifters. Things that will make the demand curve relocate itself. So before we write them down, let me just go through income, for example. If prices were $8 and you were selling 160 units, if the average income of our consumers went up by 50% and price remained the same at $8, would they tend to buy more or less? More, right? So instead of buying 160 at $8, now they're going to buy 180. And I'm just making up a number. It could have been bigger. What if the prices would have been $6? Well, they were doing here when income was average of 20,000 per year. Now that they're making 30,000 a year, they're going to buy that much. Up here at $10, they used to buy 120, now they're going to buy more. And so what we're doing is relocating the demand curve to the right when that income goes up to 30,000. So there's a new in, there's a new demand curve at each level of income. Or that makes our first shifter that we're going to put down here. So that would be something that relocates that demand curve. All the more I want you to really, 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 really buy in to the law of demand. It's a law for a reason. Like this is one of the top things here in economics. Price goes up, quantity goes down, but a lot of times people stop there. You can't stop there, especially in the upper level courses like we're in. Ceteris paribus, holding all of the things constant. Why? Because that's what we're going to be studying. We're going to be studying when you've got the U2 concert and the Bruce Springsteen concert going on at the same time, what happens if Bruce drops his prices? What happens to U2 sales? Do they go up or down? Down, right? So Bruce is cheaper. Now U2 is going to lose some people. Not the wackos. They're still going to go to U2. Right? So we're not going to lose everybody, we're going to lose some. We start seeing substitutes and complements in production and or consumption. In this case, consumption since we're on the demand curve. So our first shifter that we're going to put on here is income. And with income, we can have two types of goods that you might recall from a long time ago from econ class. And that is, anybody remember? Inferior is one and... What's the other one? Normal. It's just normal. We'll just cut to the chase here. So you can have a normal good and an inferior good. What we just depicted on this little brief example here, income goes up and I buy more, I buy more of a normal good. That's kind of the normal situation. More income, more purchases. More income and less ramen noodle purchases means you've got an inferior good. Ramen noodles are an inferior good. So with a normal good, an increase in income leads to a increase in demand. With an inferior good, if you get more money, you buy less ramen noodles. There's actually a decrease in demand. They're unrelated to income. Good question. So if, uh, if they're fairly, and we'll get into that a little bit more when we look at elasticities, but if you're pretty much not sensitive to it, then it's kind of independent of income. Um, milk tends to be pretty income inelastic. It tends to be pretty price inelastic too, for that matter, but your income doubles from 20,000 and now you're a baseball player earning a million dollars a year, do you buy more milk? No, same amount of, money, same amount of milk that you bought before, right? So income um, is something that's important with our, with our purchases. Um, two we're going to spend a lot of time on. These first two that I'm listing uh, for this class is where we'll spend a lot of uh, time on. And this is the price of related 
goods. The price of related goods. Goods can be substitutes or complements. We use them together or we use them instead of one instead of the other. So we already said uh, YouTube and Springsteen, those two were what? Substitutes or complements? Substitutes in that case. So an increase in the price of uh, Pepsi leads to a increase or decrease in the demand for Coke. Now careful, I said an increase in the price of Pepsi. Demand of Coke, demand of Coke goes up, right? So we got a little up arrow with that one. Complements, if we have an increase in the price of peanut butter, PB and J's, that leads to a increase or decrease in the demand for jelly. Decrease. So they're moving the opposite direction. All right, so just to foreshadow a little bit there, um, when we get into the advanced pricing chapters, we'll be looking at that. If we're a multi-product company, if we're Walgreens or something and we've got multiple products, how many goods do we put out on the shelves that compete with each other and how much do we try to enhance or and or price the goods when they work together with each other? All right? So we start thinking about product placement and pricing and trying to think about those sorts of things. All right, so that's price related goods. Um, So number three would be our tastes or preferences. Tastes or preferences. So I kind of like to leave this one loose, especially for this class. But if something is cool, if it is en vogue, does that tend to lead to an increase in demand or a decrease? Increase, right? So I wanted to leave that a little bit general because sometimes people uh, might confuse that with the next thing I'm going to write. How do things become cool? How do companies work hard and possibly spend a lot of money at trying to make something cool? Marketing, Marketing and advertising, right? So let's just put that as a little extra note here. Uh, companies. Uh, by advertising slash marketing to increase people's tastes or preferences. That might be just learning about the product, right? You've had those sorts of products going, wow, I could really use that to build my deck or to uh, do something at home or to read a book at night or whatever it's an educational process not so much that everybody else is doing it that it's cool but it's just an educational thing that can change people's taste or preferences okay uh, let's see here number four important one all these are kind of important but the number of consumers just sheer numbers. If Ottawa was to double in population from 13,000 to 26,000, do you think there'd be more demand for pizza on Main Street? Yeah. Right. Now that would probably attract new companies to open up pizza shops, but we're not gonna we're gonna hold that fact constant, right? Ceteris paribus. If everything remains the same and we just throw more bodies into Ottawa, there's going to be an increase in demand. So if we Number of consumers, if we increase the number of consumers, if we increase the, and let me just put pop the word population in here. An increase in the population leads to an increase in demand. So in general, if there's population growth, if we think a, a little bit bigger about you know, the state of Kansas or the, the nation of the United States, a greater population leads to an overall increase in demand. There's just going to be more 
people out there. So that type of growth is good for an economy in terms of uh, the demand side. All right, and finally here, expectations. Expectations. So expectations kind of depends on the situation, depends on what you're expecting to happen. So this is kind of a depends. So for one example, if there's a increase in the expected price, so it's kind of the expected future price of gas, do you fill your tank today or do you wait for tomorrow? Today. So if we're thinking about the demand today, an increase in future prices would lead you to an increase in demand today. And so there's a big difference here. Let me sneak in a little. We'll use this quite a bit in class. There's a couple different ways. Um, but P superscript E is the expected price. If the actual price today goes, the quantity demanded goes down. Now it's not a shift anyway, it's just a movement along. But a change in expectations would actually shift. So again, this is our five shifters. Okay. So I want to tie this right away into marginal revenue, which in a principles class I wouldn't normally do. By the way, this is pure just straight principles class. I've done a lot faster. Principles class, I take a lot more time to go through it. So, uh, but you guys got a pretty good dose of it here. You got to get the directions of what goes up, what goes down, that sort of thing. And as you read through some of that, you might fall back to your notes to, to see what was going on or to remember that. So, marginal revenue is a term we'll use in business quite a bit. We did marginal cost last time, correct? But if I remember right, we did not define marginal revenue. So, MR, marginal revenue. Does anybody want to take a stab if what marginal revenue would be? What's total revenue? <laughs> Price times quantity, good. Okay, so total revenue, let's just put some bullets here, I guess. Total revenue is equal to price times quantity. So, what would be the idea of marginal revenue? Uh, close, yeah, you got, the, you got the right concept there. There's, you're changing price and quantity, you're really looking at the change in revenue because the, the, that dynamic of how price and quantity relate to each other turns out to be a big thing that we're going to be getting into. Um, so instead of in price and change in quantity, let's just talk about the change in total revenue. So we can think about the uh, change in total revenue. And when, if you look back to your marginal cost, what was that formula. I think some of you wrote it on your sheets. So change in price divided by the change in no, not price. Change in, total, uh, total cost. change in total cost from a change in quantity, right? So an incremental amount. By the way, that kind of reminds me, uh, the thing I sent you was those video links to that restaurant example. Really encourage you to go through and look at that restaurant. It doesn't even take too long. It's probably 15 minutes. There's like six videos on a playlist that will bring you through. Uh, that whole example. So marginal revenue then uh, is the change in total revenue from the change in quantity. So the formula almost looks the same as it did for marginal cost. Marginal cost was the change in total cost from the additional unit produced. Now we're looking at how much money's coming in after we produce. Okay, so here let me touch on Gabby's uh, 
point there with these, how these things are working. What does the law of demand tell us about revenue? If we decrease price, is quantity going to go up? It's supposed to, yeah, law of demand, and it will. Ceteris paribus, it will, right? Because any story that you tell me, I'll pretty much debunk on you. On, well, wait a second, if they cut price during World War II on this and they sold more, well, there were circumstances that were changing of why that didn't work out, right? Because it just doesn't make sense that something would be cheaper and people would buy less, unless there's some other circumstances that are in the, in the story. So um, if we cut price, um, are we going to sell more, I guess, is the question. So the law of demand says a decrease in price leads to an increase in quantity. So is there an increase in total revenue, question mark? We don't know. Ah, but we might be able to know, but that's what we need to work on. We don't know in general from what, what we've done here, that's for sure. So how could it go up? If you can try to, try to quantify this for me, how could it possibly go up? We got the price effect and the quantity effect. What would need to be bigger? The quantity effect, right? So if you could imagine two different effects, like if this went down a little bit and this went up by a whole bunch, then we'd be in business. But if this went down big time and this only went up by a little bit, we'd be screwed, right? So that's kind of the sophisticated language we want to use when we start thinking about uh, our next topic here of elasticity. Okay, now before I want to come back to this picture and beat up on it a little bit more by thinking about the marginal revenue of the 140th unit. So what is the revenue generated by the 140th unit? So let's write that down here. So marginal revenue of the 140th unit. Now, you're not always going to have the luxury of me adding on this little at the end to remind you that it's really on an incremental unit basis. So if you're looking at it on a table or on a homework problem or on a test, it might just say the marginal revenue associated with producing 140 units or something like that. So uh, I'm kind of helping you out here thinking about the revenue. What is the revenue associated with the 140th? How'd you get that? 140 by what? $9. Times $9 equals 12.60. And so that is the, that's the total revenue? Okay, I wanted the marginal revenue. Okay. So this is actually Q times P here? Yeah. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I'm rolling with you. Just keep keep me coming. Keep me going. Not necessarily you either. If anybody wants to jump in, so are we done? I mean, we don't have our answer yet. That's that's you fessed up that this is total revenue. You caught it quick enough as you were working through it in your brain, which is good. Okay. So what what do you want to do, Skylar? No, you pick. Be brave. All right, so if we take another point of 120 and 10 and calculate what? So the total revenue associated with producing 120, now at 10 equals 1,200. Okay. what we're doing so far, but I don't think we have our answer. Sixty over twenty. Why'd you do that? Okay. Sixty is the difference between twelve sixty and twelve hundred. 
the quantity actually bumped up by 20. Good. So that's the one little catch here that we have. So marginal revenue equals the change in total revenue derived from a change, a small incremental change. Ideally, this would be one, but sometimes you don't have that kind of data. So we're kind of really averaging it over those quantities, by the way. So we're bump, all we've got is these two points that we need to work with, uh, 120 and 40. So if we take this, we've got $60 divided by the incremental 20 units, giving us a marginal revenue of three. $3 per unit? Yes, $3 per unit. So the marginal revenue associated with 140 units, or the 140th unit is $3. All of these in between are kind of $3 as well. So here would be three. We averaged them over this little section, so really we kind of have something that looks like that. What about the marginal revenue of the next chunk here? What happens there? Be the same. Okay, let's do it. 160 times something, and I'll let you guys do the math this time. I don't want to just take Take your answers as gospel. We better at least do a little good faith double checking. I don't know. I haven't worked. I just made up these numbers. I don't know. I'm relying on you guys. I do know that it can't be three. I can tell you that much. Dollar. Okay. So what was the revenue generated by 160? So total revenue was 1280. Yeah. I'm just going to do a little shorthand here and say 160. We already know that at 140 it was right. So the actual incremental change here on revenue was only 20. How many more units did we produce? 20. So all of these kind of averaging them out is down here. Now that's a weird result. Not quite maybe what your intuition is. How much are we selling the 160th unit for? Eight bucks. But the revenue generated by it is only one buck? That's weird. I figured that. One important thing you got to catch on to with this that's giving us that result. That result is right. What's going on that the revenue generated by the 160th unit was a dollar, but yet we sold it for eight bucks? The revenue generated by the 140th unit was three bucks. My line doesn't line up very good here, does it? Uh, was three bucks, but yet we sold it for nine. Right? So, why is the revenue generated by an extra unit less than the price of the unit? Why? No, we're not bringing cost. We do have cost, presumably, but sometimes our problems don't. But um, no. Not really because of quantity. It has something to do with the prices. So the 160th unit created revenue, additional revenue for me of a dollar, yet I was selling it at eight. This is kind of weird. Now, the hunt, go ahead if you got it. You solved the puzzle. The 140th, when I was selling 140 total, let's kind of be straight here. When I'm selling 140, 
I can get nine bucks per unit for all 140. Right? When I ramp up, my price falls from nine to eight, right? So I'm selling not only the extra 20 units at $8, but what? I hear an aha moment. Yep. Everybody starting to see that? Let me bring it alive here with a little bit of a area for you. Um, Cause you're gonna need to know how to do these areas too. So you got $1,280 of total revenue, which is price times quantity, right? So quantity of 160, price of eight, height, base times height is the area of a rectangle. That's this rectangle, right? At 140 units, the total revenue is this rectangle. Now, when I produce the next 20 units, I'm adding this much more revenue. But I'm losing this much revenue. I gain the orange area, but I lose the green area, right? All the previous units that, I'm, that I had, I'm having to cut price on them too. And so that's what gives us this result, which is, which is an interesting one that we'll tackle in different ways later. All right, so is everybody seeing that all right? So let's see here. One of the key results here. So the marginal revenue of the 140th unit was, uh, just to keep this a little straight here, $3. Uh, the marginal revenue of the 160th unit is equal to $1. In general, marginal revenue is less than the price. for each unit sold because to sell more units you have to drop price not only for the extra units, the marginal units, but all previous too. I'm going to put a word up here that we'll talk about later, but I think it'll be helpful to have it in your notes right here. This assumes no price discrimination. Assumes no price discrimination. Which is when the fun really starts. Because that's when, and that's what a lot of businesses do, They're looking at this problem just the way you guys are, thinking, well, we're currently selling 140. Is there any way we could possibly sell more to some new people without alienating our old customers, right? That's really what's going on here. Can I cut the price for an extra person? So maybe I say special lunch special, but new customers only or whatever, right? You've seen those sorts of pricing schemes. That's what we're gonna get into later. All right, so this is the single price situation where you, there's kind of one price that you can sell your product for and that's it, which is true in a lot of markets as well. You can't price discriminate. All right, questions there? Um, Boy, I don't know if I can 
stretch this thing more than I should or not. That's kind of helpful in a way. Um, let, let's let's do it. You guys are smart enough, I can tell. Uh, yeah, maybe it'll get too clunky since I don't have an intercept. Let's let's just start. You guys are smart enough, but I'm I'm maybe not smart enough to, <laughs> to pull that one. What I was reluctant to put on there was this consumer surplus that we talked about at the beginning of class today. So let's just put up a fresh sock demand curve here, assuming we're still on socks. And let's just say that the intercept now is $100. And we're looking at the uh, we've currently got a price of 50 such that we're selling, um, oh, I don't know, nice to just keep the numbers easy. I guess we'll do 1,000. So we've got 1,000 socks being sold at a price of 50, that one point on the demand curve. So when we draw the uh, marginal revenue curve in, it turns out to look like this. So I'm going to put in a dashed line. There's a little trick that you can do. So if you let the demand curve go all the way to your horizontal axis, and you take, gosh, I almost picked it, didn't I? That's too bad. Well, depending on your graph, just draw it the way it goes. But if you take the midpoint, and I guess I'm going to pick this midpoint too. <laughs> I might cheat a little bit. So this represents the midpoint between that point and the origin. If you take the middle point and then start up at the end point of 100 and just draw, let's just lightly draw a dash line all the way through that point. That is the marginal revenue curve, which is what we were doing here with this little stair step thing. So if we were to average them in, it would have been coming down too. So that is the marginal revenue curve kind of graphed out in all its glory. So there's a number of things going on with the business at one time, it's helpful sometimes to remember that you've got people over here, people over here, people over here. We were talking about value earlier. And let's say this is at 200 units, this is at 500, and this is at 700. How do I have people ordered by looking at this curve? Who's first over here? Who's these early for the good or they're they're what? Poor. It's just their value is not great. Their value is not as great. They're poor. Is everybody on that same line of thought? Yeah, I said their value is not as strong. Okay. And why do you say that? I think I know now. I was perplexed at first, but maybe I know now why. Why the demand is not as strong? Yeah. Well, I, and I'm thinking about these first 200 people. So we're selling, let's just say we're, we got them priced at 50 bucks and we're selling 1,000 of them. I'm trying to talk about the, the value placed on these first 200 socks. I'm hearing you guys saying low value, they're a little bit poor. They're, they're paying for the higher price. They're, they're, yeah. There are sock wackos, yes. They are the athletes that have to have these sweat sucking socks come out of their bodies because they run you know, 30 miles a week or whatever. So there are high valued customers, not low. And where, where I was thinking maybe you guys were, certain, were a little confused on it is, um, 
Although it shouldn't be confusing for that point either, but uh, I don't know. I'm not gonna make up any excuses for you. I don't know why. Well, you tell me. Why did? What, what was your? What, I'm, I'm curious. What was your intuition that was leading you down that? What were you looking at that wasn't quite? I was getting price and quantity confused. Okay. So I thought reading the, the chart, uh, the 200 I was equating with the money was big. Okay. You know, Good. That's what I like to know. I mean, I like to know where wherever you went, you went for your reason. I'm not. But it's helpful for me as an educator to know why you went there, and then maybe I can present it differently in the future. Look at it backwards. Look at it backwards. So they had this inverted uh, uh, dyslexia thing going on. Yeah, I, I think that happens sometimes. Our brain, our brain flips. So, what I was trying to do here was think about that high value person because the person who bought the two hundredth sweat sock, if we were to break them down, they were willing to pay a lot of money. Right? They were willing to pay, and apparently this is a multi-pack of socks or something, so we've got somebody who's willing to pay $85 for the socks, but they only paid 50 And they're like, hey, these are a deal. I'll buy it. Just like the people we were talking about before. And so now we say that there's this much consumer surplus. On the 200th pair, there's $35 worth of consumer value, bonus value, if you will, what we call consumer surplus. In order to sell more socks, if you were charging $85, you would be selling 200 socks. But if you wanna sell more, you gotta cut your price. Because if you cut your price, you'll sell more. In fact, you'll sell 300 sock pairs more if you cut your price down to $62. I don't wanna make it looking like we're doing anything too fancy here with our numbers, but. Okay, so now we're going to sell more socks, but of course we're gonna lose a little bit of that revenue we were doing before, but we're gonna gain a whole bunch of revenue from selling 300 more pairs of socks. So there's that balance of quantity and price that we were just talking about earlier that the business is thinking about. I'm having to cut a little bit of price, but I'm selling, am I making it up in volume? What I'm losing in price. So these folks here, the 500th pair, Somebody was getting $12 worth of consumer surplus still. So one thing to anchor for you is that every, we're selling socks at 50, if we're selling 1,000, everybody's getting a little bit of value. So we have consumers effectively ranked from the highest valued consumer to the lowest valued consumer. So you might even add a little spectrum here so here on this end of the spectrum, we got the highest uh, value consumer. Consumers who place the highest value on the good. And then we've got the lowest. It's kind of the spectrum here. And so the, uh, I guess the question and the puzzle that we're going to try to uh, figure out is, can I sell more product without alienating my high value customer, right? So maybe can I do things to keep my high value people and still sell to the low value people too? Or do circumstances have it such that I can only sell one price? And then it's simple. You just drop your price if you want to sell more and um, if not. So this then, this little triangular region, would represent all of the consumer's surplus. So the consumer surplus for the market of all consumers. This is that extra value that they get. I don't think I'll take the time to write down the definition. You guys got that in your book, but. It's the value for each additional unit, the extra value that you get above the price. That's right, we're not gonna get it, the consumer gets it, yes. Which highlights kind of the value creation thing that we were talking about before how there's winners on both sides. The, the seller is making some money uh, and the consumer is getting some benefit as well.
Now, by the way, that with the value. Don't confuse that, right? So the benefit that the consumer gets is 85. But if they're paying 50, then it's like this extra bonus surplus. So that's why it's consumer surplus is the 35. Anything else? Clarifications on that? On the 200th unit, yes. Um, the consumer surplus of the 35th, 35th, 200th unit, 35 on my brain, 200th unit is $35. The consumer surplus uh, for all units is equal to a little geometry. Who remembers a right triangle? Close. Divide it in half. Divide, cut in half. Half the base times height. So base times height is the rectangle. Cut it in half, you got a triangle. So one half base times height gives us a height. Now be careful with your height. We're going all the way over to the last, to the first unit. Uh, you know, the unit number one here, but we're just taking it here. So 50 is the height. So one half of the base, which is a thousand units, the unit, number of units that we're selling, times a height of 50, 2,500, 2, good. The 200th person, the person who bought the 200th pair of socks, got 35 of that 2,500 for the entire market. All right, everybody on that? Now, as long as we're having so much fun, what rectangle here represents the total revenue for the company? The total revenue. For, like, socks? Yes. Inside here, the whole box. Okay, why? Well, you're doing good so far. You're selling for 50, and how many are you selling? And you're selling 1,000. Base times height would give you that whole area. So this area here would represent the total revenue. This is just kind of an extra little bonus note. I usually don't mix this stuff together, but I think um, especially the way this chapter uh, jumps into this mixing of marginal cost and total revenue and marginal revenue, I think it's helpful to see that graphically because you won't see this graph in your, in your text. All right. So... Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time on elasticity, so maybe we better take a break. Unless you guys want to stretch till another half hour. Or roughly, I don't know how long it'll take. <laughs> Vote, break, anybody dying, like busting? <laughs> Continue on? All right, let's just wait a little bit. Since we're on fire, nobody's... Nobody's jumping. Okay, so um, let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's see. We're not going to use this one. This was all kind of prep material for you for this first part in dealing with the elasticity of demand. So that demand curve is a line. What is the slope of the demand curve that we still have drawn on the board over there? Slope of the
the demand curve. Three dollars over one dollar. How'd you get that? From our large revenue. Okay. But I want the slope of the demand curve. One over twenty. One over twenty. So rise over run. You're close. Down one over twenty. What's the slope? Negative one. Negative one twentieth. Yes. Okay, so rise of a run, it's actually a negative rise, which is a fall. So that's important as we start to calculate these, these elasticities. Um, uh, not that I care that much about the positive or negative, I just don't want you to see, see you screw up the formula when you, when you insert it in there. So the law of demand tells us that that number is going to be negative. The slope is, is positive. So if you guys want to add something on to this graph, just put on here just for fun. Slope, rise over run, negative 1 over 20. So we got a one, negative 120 slope. So you were doing the slope between this point and this point, right? What would it be down here? Same. Same, good. Okay, we don't want to forget that. Uh, it's the same on any point on a linear demand curve. Demand curves do not need to be linear, by the way. That's usually a, a simplifying assumption we make, that it's a straight line. All right. Let's see. I'm going to draw. Let's see. What am I going to draw? I guess I'm going to draw two graphs stacked on top of each other. So give yourself enough room to do something like that. So they're stacked on top of each other because if this is, um, well, let me pick out a number here. I guess I'll start here. If this is 100 units, then that corresponds with 100 units down here. So we're measuring quantity in the same scale on the horizontal axis. Up top, we're going to be looking at price. And oh, let's see here. Let's just do just an, any old demand curve, I guess, that looks like that. So let's do $10 and 100 units. And then if we look at another point at $9. And let's say this cranks up to 105. Now if I try another point here at 11, and this is a linear demand curve, what is this number? 90, uh, 95. 95. Okay, so slope is constant. We've got three points. Just call them A, B, and C. All right, so um, we want to start to think about that relationship between price and 
quantity of where, of which one's bigger, that effect, the price effect or the quantity effect. Um, and what we're going to learn is that it changes along the demand curve when we think about it in, ter in percentage terms. So the elasticity of demand going from point A to B, we're trying to think about, well, what's happening between uh, prices and quantities? So the elasticity of demand, let me give you a couple generic definitions here first. And I believe the book calls, does it call it the elasticity or price? It does say price elasticity. So the price elasticity of demand, which I'm going to be using this little notation. Well, actually, I'll just, I'll attempt to follow the notation in your book, which is simply this little E. So the elasticity of demand is equal to the ratio of the percentage change in quantity demanded over the percentage change in price. Is that percentage Yes. The percentage change in quantity over the percentage change in price. So if we're going from A to B, let's stay focused here on A to B for first. What is the percentage change in price? Dollar. Dollar. Is that a percentage change? That's the change. So what's the, what would you call it the percentage change? 1% or roughly 20%? Uh, a to B. So we got one dollar change. I'm with you on that. And then how do you calculate a percentage change? Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, we're kind of leaving out slope right now because we're just thinking about the percentage change in price. So if something's a hundred bucks and there's a twenty percent sale, what are you expecting to pay? If you're going shopping and you find some clothes for a hundred bucks and there's a 20% off sale, what are you expecting to pay? 80 bucks, right? So what is the percentage change here? How did you calculate change? And then what do you do to express it as a percent? You divide it by the original price. Good. So that's our, our kind of our old definition of, of um, percentage changes is the new number minus the old number divided by the old number. That's kind of the older or the old fashioned way that I always remember for doing it. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> we do it a little differently in econ for this particular problem. We use what's called the midpoint formula because we don't want to be biased towards a decrease or an increase because if you did it from going from 10 to 11, it's a dollar change divided by the old, which is 10, which would give us a 10% change. But if you did it going the other direction, then the old number would be 11 and you'd have one divided by 11, right? So the denominator would change depending on if you're going up or down. So to make it fair, we're going to use $10.50 and think about the elasticity right there, okay? So we're gonna take the average of the two to get that point. Now, rather than bore you with the math that you guys are all very capable of doing, I'll show you later if you want, I'm not going to, I'm just gonna kinda of jump to the chase of what the formula is um, in these terms. And if you take the, you take this expression and look at Q1 minus Q2 and divide that by Q1 plus Q2 and then take that number and divide it by the price difference and then add the price differences back together.
this whole expression gives you the elasticity of demand. So I want you to maintain your gut feeling, by the way, of about 1%. Okay, I still want you to maintain that. And by the way, what are you talking about down here? About 5%, right? So keep that about on there. When you do this formula, the expressions will kind of flip around a little bit, but um, let's go ahead and do it. Calculate those numbers. Maybe somebody take uh, the quantity, somebody the quantities and you do have for keeping the sign correct the new number old number business so the new number if we're moving from a to b the new number is a hundred old number was 95 so we got uh, minus five nine or let's just write it out 95 minus 100 over 195 and then we've got the, the prices, which is 11 minus 10 over 21. And so somebody pull out their calculators, give me what the upstairs number here is, negative something, negative, negative 0 0.025. 0 0.025, okay. 0 0.025, negative 0 0.025, negative 0 0.047, okay, and this one's a positive. And then do the final one here. Negative 0.53. All right, we just calculated the elasticity of demand at that midpoint. So right here, we'd be at an elasticity of demand in absolute value of 0.53. Notice how I just snuck that right in on you. Remember putting those bars around it? No big deal, 0.53. So that's the absolute value. So when you do the calculation, you should always come out with a negative value. But since everybody knows it's negative, economists at some point in time, I don't know who to even blame, I think it was mostly just to screw students up, decided to talk about them as a positive. And so we usually talk about them as a positive number um, and in this case, we're expressing it in terms of, of its absolute value, which is going to come in handy in some other sophisticated formulas later, too. Now, let's quickly do this point. What is this one? What if we move from B to C? I'll give you a hint. It's not going to say the same. So go ahead and get your calculators out. It's not going to be the same. Yes. Call this A B. And this elasticity now is B C. Okay, so I know that that's possibly right. You got that too? Good. All right, so we got two people to the good on that. 0.46. Now, the reason I knew that it was possibly right, of course I didn't know that this one was maybe wrong, is that I knew the direction of what, how the number should be changing as I'm snaking along the demand curve. Now, let's go to the extreme points to really get our gut feeling going here. So if we have a five unit change here and we move from five units to 10 units, about how, what kind of percentage change is that? If we go from five to 10, yeah, it's like doubling, right? So it'd be a 100% change if we're going from five to five. 5 to 10, right? So we're increasing 5. We started at 5. 5 divided by 5 is 1. Slide the decimal place over 2 spots. We got 
change, we're doubling it. Now, that's associated with a price change way up here where we might be at 21 and 20. Right? So now we've got a $1 change. Well, and it would be 5. Remember, I'm keeping the slope the same here. So 5 and 1. So we'd have a 1 and a 20, which would be a very small percentage change in price. So as we're at a point way up here, what's big and what's small? Prices. Prices. Careful. Quantity is? What was this number again? 5 to 10 was what percentage change? 100%. This one was a dollar to 20. So from $20 to $21, that change would be very small. small. Big change, small change, overall number is big. So we got elasticities that are big numbers up here. And down here, we have just the opposite. If we're going from $1 to $2, what's the approximate percentage change there? $1 to $2, 100% again, yeah, we got it, 100%. The quantity would be really large and the five unit change would be relatively small. So now we've got a small number big number, this one's getting really small. So as we move along the demand curve, our numbers start to approach, in fact, at this end point here, we've got an elasticity in absolute value that is very close to zero. And up here at this end point, we've got an elasticity that's very close to infinity, but it never quite gets there. Now that sets up our whole range of elasticities. So let me put down some key points here. The absolute value of the elasticity ranges between infinity and zero along the linear demand curve. A linear downward sloping demand curve, which is what we deal with a lot. The elasticity of demand, kind of a special anchoring point, turns out to be one. So somewhere the elasticity of demand equals one. We're going from zero to infinity. And I want to just pause on that one and look at the formula. Let you guys catch up. What's going on with the formula when it equals 1? Quantity, Quantity falls by 10%. So it's kind of a wash on revenues, right? The positive effect offsets the negative effect. They're equal to each other. So that's kind of a special anchoring part point. So somewhere this equals 1, which implies the percentage change in quantity demanded is equal to the percentage change in price. And we call that unitary elastic demand. Demand is unitary elastic. All right, questions on that? Um, should your key formula shift to zero and then to the switch? Maybe. Um, Infinity is less than E. Yeah. 
Good catch, good catch, yes. It's between zero and less than infinity. Okay, anything else? All right, so you're probably dying to know, well, what the heck do we draw this thing for down here? Um, so what we're gonna measure here is total revenue, which equals price times quantity as we started off with today. So what is the total revenue associated with producing 100 units? Thousand. Okay, so a thousand. So I'm going to mark off one point here. At a hundred units, we have one thousand dollars. If we cut our price to nine dollars, what is the total revenue? Uh, give me exact number. Pull out your calculator. 9 times 105. 945. 945? I, I just heard you say 45 and then hear the 9 part. Okay, so 945. And this is at 105. And the other point. 1045. Well, that's kind of weird that it came out to be 1040. That the keep in mind that the distances are not, the changes are not. Don't let that 45 fool you, right? We've got 55 units. Right? So it was changing. Okay. So, um, let me just pick off a number. Um, well, we're not close enough to do that, are we? Yeah, I don't want to run you through that same exercise, but um, let me let me just do it this way. So this is part of the total revenue function. Total revenue function. Should this person, should this business be cutting their price? Is that a good idea? Hey, we got to sell more. Well, let's have a sale. Let's, let's cut price. No. Not under these circumstances, right? They're cutting their price, and they're having less money in the cash register at the end of the day. So we got to be careful on when we cut price. Furthermore, one cut of price might have a different effect than another cut in price. I cut the price by a buck here, and I lose $45 worth of revenue. I cut the price by a buck here, and I lose $55, going from 1,000 to 945. So it doesn't always have the same effect, and that's why, so the elasticity is helping us balance that effect. Well, let's add that onto the keys here. So note, the change in total revenue from a change in price depends on the elasticity of demand. So from our example, point A to B, well, let me just go decrease in price. A decrease in price by $1 from point A to B caused a decrease in total revenue of 45 bucks.
a decrease in price by a dollar from point B to C caused a decrease in total revenue of $55. So even though you're still just changing to buy a buck, you're not getting the same effect on total revenue. Crazy, crazy stuff. So, this last graph before we go on a break, I promise you will help you in working through some problems, and I don't think you'll find it in the book if I remember right, not in this book. So, in general, let's put the two graphs stacked on top of each other again. Got the demand curve here. Make your demand curve start somewhere and terminate at the horizontal axis. Then bring that horizontal axis right down to here, just like we did, make just a point. We're going to be measuring total revenue, which equals price times quantity. I want all you guys to get this far, and then we're going to Skyler, you remember this one from class before? See, I think you had macro. I remember you doing that. I don't think you, you had micro from, or did you have micro from me too? You didn't have both from me, right? We talked no, about that. Well, yeah. I I right. All right. Everybody caught up? Scott, what's going on? All right, I gave you a little trick earlier on drawing the marginal revenue curve. What was it? Ryan? Right in the middle. It's cutting down the middle, that's right. So from a math standpoint, it's twice the slope and lies below it. And we learned earlier, remember, that the price that we're selling our product for is greater than the revenue generated by the extra unit, so that whole stuff. So kind of remember that marginal revenue lies below it. Turns out to be twice as steep. How we graph that is you find the midpoint and then just draw a straight line down to it. And as we'll learn in a second, it's okay to draw it a little bit negative even. Most of the pictures that you look at might not show that negative part for a reason we'll talk about in a moment. Where that point was was unique because it showed you where the demand is unitary elastic. So at this point, directly north of that bisection point of the marginal revenue, the elasticity of demand is equal to one. It's unitary elastic. We already set the stage before that zero is down here and infinity is up here. So any time that the demand elasticity, the price elasticity of demand is less than one in absolute value, we say that demand is inelastic. So this is the inelastic demand or the inelastic range of the demand. Anytime the elasticity of demand is greater than one, demand is said to be elastic. So this is the elastic portion of the demand curve. Downstairs, 
the revenue function looks like this. Drop this point now down somewhere here. I don't really care where and draw a big dot. You're going to be down here for revenue, zero times zero. So we got this point where we've priced it at three for zero. And we're selling a whole bunch. We like sales, but that's a little too low of a price, right? So the revenue function looks like this. It's a big hump and comes down. So this is the total revenue function. All right, I would memorize this graph. It conveys a lot of information on stuff that when you guys see a problem four chapters from now, they're just gonna say, okay, suppose demand is elastic or suppose demand is inelastic. You know, what, what happens if we do such and such? So this is kind of helpful. And here's one of the main things it does for us in showing that relationship between total revenue and the demand curve. If this particular business is at point A and cuts the price to B, so it's moving along this demand curve, doing a cut in price, that point is associated with A prime and B prime down on the total revenue function. So as we cut price and we sell more, we're getting more money in the cash register. That's what we hope is happening, right? A lot of businesses do that, but they don't always get the result that they like. So we've learned something here that in order to get the result that, that they like, what has to be true about the demand for their product? Does it need to be elastic or inelastic? Elastic. elastic. So if they have elastic demand, then a cut in price will raise revenues, if that's what they were intending to do so by that. However, as the case we kind of worked through, if you cut price here from point C to point D, and it could be the exact same price change of $1 or $2, but the difference is demand was elastic now because prices are that low, that's associated with C prime and D prime on the total revenue function, and that immediately tells you that a cut in price here is gonna to lead to a decrease in total revenue. Probably not what you're looking to have happen. Questions on that graph? All right, let's take a break now.